So I'm Cody Benkelman. This is going to be about um, workflows for optimizing image, imagery sharing and serving in the cloud. Um, the last slide, I'll ask you to fill out the survey, and I'll just warn you right now, I've got too much material to go over in 30 minutes. So I'll skip some things, and you may mark me down for it, but I don't have much choice. Um, so I want to go ahead and get started. Um, our, our objectives in terms of sharing imagery in the cloud or to make imagery accessible to uh, your organization or your, your users. And typically, we're looking at massive volumes of uh, data, uh, partly because imagery is inherently large, and also looking at the elastic compute uh, capability of the cloud. But one of the, one of, one of the motivations that makes, this, makes imagery different is just the, the very, very large data volumes. Um, so some of the advantages of working in the cloud, uh, I, again, presumably you're aware of, uh, of the advantages and disadvantages of the cloud, but what I often focus on or what I hear from clients that are using the cloud, one key reason to move to the cloud is because you've got such large data volumes. And I know cloud storage isn't exactly cheap, but it's less expensive in many cases than having your own storage for very, very large data sets. The other is if you've got to scale up to a very large number of users and if, that, if you need that elasticity to scale up and scale back to serve large numbers of users and then potentially scale back. And then, of course, in some organizations, you've got both, both of those issues. Um, some of the disadvantages, or perhaps rather than call it disadvantages, just issues to be aware of, are the, the challenge of getting those large data volumes into the cloud, uh, and part of what I want to focus on are some of those next few bullets, the, uh, the different storage types. Um, and I do have notes on the potential security concerns. I don't think we'll have time to go over that today, but if you want to hear about how we deal with some of the security issues with accessing imagery in the cloud, let me know, and we can certainly follow up afterward. Um, so I think that's about enough of that. So, what I want to talk about today, there, there are basically three components or three key topics that I want to touch on. The data model for uh, the way we recommend large, managing large uh, collections of imagery. If you've heard me speak before, you've probably heard this before. And I'm assuming that everybody here is already using Mosaic data sets. So I'm going to, for the most part, skip over that, but I'll just show you a few slides. I guess very quickly, is there anyone here who's does not know what a mosaic data set is and is not currently using that? Okay, good, so I can skip over that. So I'm gonna focus more on the central part, the data storage options, and then some on the system configurations. Um, so this is going to be background, and again, this is just gonna be very, very quick review. Again, if any of this is something you haven't heard before, please see me afterward or, or get my email and let's talk again. Um, but the mosaic data set is the fundamental data model we use for managing large collections of imagery. And the key is you don't, the mosaic data set is a database structure, but you don't bring your imagery into the database. It's just the structure for accessing your imagery on disk. And again, I'm skipping over this, assuming you've heard this story before. Uh, the fundamental method we recommend for managing large collections is to use, put each collection into its own source mosaic data set and stop and do your QC at this point, and then merge your collections together into one centralized collection. And again, I'm gonna stop here for just a moment. If you haven't seen this, I wanna really highlight that comment in the center. Do not use the default raster type. If you're merging mosaics into mosaics, you wanna use the table raster type um, to centralize your data collection, and again, I apologize for skipping over this quickly, but I assume you may have heard this story before. Once we've managed that data in a central collection, we can then use Image Server to share imagery out. And in the case of multispectral imagery, this is just one example. You can attach server functions to give pan sharpened imagery, natural color, color infrared, functions like NDVI. That's all done on the fly. Uh, unless you're moving to raster analytics, which I'll come back around to toward the end of this. Um, then one of the advantages, uh, the key point of this architecture is when you add new imagery, it's, everything downstream from that centralized collection is already done. You don't, have to read, you don't have to rebuild the pan sharpening or if you've got elevation data, you don't rebuild the hillshade and the slope and aspect. 
Uh, so that's all, that's all done downstream. Oh, and one other note, if you hadn't seen this before, what w the, the terminology we're using, calling it source mosaic and derived mosaic, that's just a convention within our workflows team. So if you look in the documentation, there may be a few references to that, but there's nothing in the software menus that says this is a source mosaic. That's just a convention for how we're managing things. So again, if you haven't seen this before, let me know. Okay, so that was about five minutes. Um, and this we could go into for considerable more detail, but the, in the light blue at the top, there's a landing page for our workflows. And on this workflows page, you can find a deep dive of discussion of these topics. Uh, and if you jump to the link uh, highlighted in the bottom, we've got downloadable sample scripts. So if you want to implement some of this and see exactly how we did it, that's what these scripts are for. So again, apologies for that quick overview, but I want to get into uh, the newer material. Um, so what I want to talk about now is how we, uh, some options we have and what we recommend for data storage and access in the cloud. So historically on the left, you've got a computer, whether it's a server or just your desktop accessing a local disk. If you've got a lot of data, you might be using a network attached storage. When we get to the cloud, part of the advantage is the elasticity and that essentially infinite disk called S3 storage. So you never run out of disk space, but it's fundamentally different because we're accessing now with HTTP calls instead of uh, as a uh, a file system. So uh, this, I got this slide from my boss, Peter. I'm glad he put some, some numbers up here, but this is just to give you an indication of some of the costs, and this is specific to Amazon S3. Um, I'll, I'm gonna come back and talk about the instance store, but if you're not aware of that, when you start up an, uh, an instance in the cloud in Amazon, they give you some free storage that's attached directly to that server, but it is, we, we also use the term ephemeral. If that server goes down, you lose everything on that disk. So you can't afford to put your only copy of data on that disk, but we do use that instant store disk in some of this architecture. Um, and then on the right-hand side, one of the key issues is using a file sharing system. We haven't found a system yet that really performs efficiently, so this is fundamentally not recommended. It's not to say you can't do it. At not to say it won't work, but the performance is not as good as what we recommend. Um, using, using the simple storage, uh, this is just another sales pitch, I guess, for Amazon uh, in terms of their availability and the pricing. Um, but the key is we want to be able to access data directly from that S3 storage. Um, this is just a quick slide to give credit uh, and, and acknowledge that Amazon's not the only game in town. We do work with Azure as well. Uh, many of the examples I'll show are Amazon, but, but this architecture and this structure certainly works in Azure. I'm not as certain about Google Cloud. I'd have to ask some of my colleagues. I think we are doing work there as well. Um, okay, so I'm gonna slow down and focus on this one a little bit. To optimize for this architecture we're moving toward, we wanna be able to use the inexpensive storage on the left. To do that, we want to be, we need to, in, we don't need to, we typically recommend that you optimize the, the format of your data. And, and I'll come back to that. You don't necessarily have to change formats, but in some cases it's to your advantage to rewrite your image in a different format. So I'll, um, and, and I guess one point on that is I would, I would hesitate to tell you to take terabytes of data and reformat them for no other reason than reformatting, although there are some cases where some file formats are slower, but knowing that we've got to copy data into the cloud, sometimes we can do this all at once. If you've got to make a physical copy anyway, we can do the optimization while we're making that copy, so it doesn't really cost you time or disk space to do that. Um, to enable the elasticity, we want ArcGIS to be able to access data directly from S3. So where you see right in the middle it says driver to enable HTTP access, that's one of the things we've added and that's part of the, one of the key topics, I guess, or key points I wanna make sure that, that everybody understands is how we can actually do that and directly access from S3 instead of from a file system. And then when we do that, we, anytime you pan and zoom the map, if you access a block of pixels, we will then cache that locally 
And that's where we're using that free, uh, no charge instant storage that Amazon provides attached to your, uh, to your EC2 instance. And then I'll, and I'll come back to some of these points again. I'm gonna mostly skip over this slide, but again, if you wanna know the difference between raw TIFF with data stored in stripes versus tiled, if you've got a lot of JPEG 2000, this would also apply to Mr. Sid, or uh, it's a little different with ECW format, but any of the uh, wavelet compressed formats in the upper right, I'm mostly skipping over this. Where I wanna focus is this MRF format in the lower right, and the, a couple of key advantages, again, I'll focus on this in some later slides, but it does have tiled access, so you don't have to read through a large block of data you don't need just to get to the tile you do need. Uh, we've, there are a number of compression options. Again, I've skipped over a lot of this, but with MRF format, we've got the same options as GeoTIFF. Esri also has a compression format called LERC, Limited Error Rate limited error raster compression. It's primarily for uh, floating point data, such as elevation. Uh, also works well with categorical data, and it's very fast because the, de the decompression can be implemented in JavaScript, so that's one of the advantages of Lurk. And again, apologies for skipping over some of these things, uh, but here I wanna stop a little bit and talk specifically about um, fundamentally, or primarily, the one on the right, where we've optimized and, and again, I'll, I'll, I've got one more slide to talk about the MRF format. Um, but the key with, with, uh, with this format is it, it was built specifically for the cloud. I'm wondering, well, my next slide goes into more detail on this. With striped TIFF, if you're trying to access a, a block of pixels, you may have to skip over a lot of data. So this is uh, definitely not an optimized format. Internal to your TIFF files, if you are going to use TIFF files, we recommend using a tiled TIFF, where internal to the file, it's broken up into tiles, but it will still look like one single file. Uh, but the optimum that we're moving toward and we're using quite a bit is this MRF format, where the data file has been separated into three components. The pixels, of course, are the large data volume that, you're, that you struggle with managing and dealing with, but we've taken all the metadata and put that into a very, very small, very lightweight file, so when ArcGIS server needs to access data, if it's accessing from the cloud and it's downloading the metadata component, it's a very small file, even if your pixels may be gigabytes or larger. The spatial index is also in a separate file. So what you're seeing on the far right, when we access this format, we're going to cache locally those small metadata files that you need to know where all the data is, and then as we use the pixels, those are actually cached locally as well. Um, so hopefully that made enough sense on that. Uh, let me now focus in specifically on the MRF format. So it, it stands for Meta Raster Format. This was developed at NASA, I think JPL. But again, it splits the file into several components. Uh, there, there may be more. In, in, Arc, in the case of ArcGIS specifically, we have the AUX.XML file. There are other metadata files, but the key is we've separated the large data volume of the pixels from the rest of the, the files that you need to access, in, uh, that you need to access frequently. Um, it is open source. This has been implemented in GDAL 2.1, so we're very excited about it in ArcGIS, but this is not ArcGIS proprietary. Other, other companies are using the MRF format. Uh, there are multiple compression options on that previous slide, uh, but again, if you're using Lurk, that's actually very lightweight and can be decompressed in uh, using JavaScript in a browser. Uh, this is built in now to ArcGIS, I think at 10.5, TJ, do you remember? Is it 10.5 we added MRF? So if you've got MRF files, they will be recognized by ArcGIS. And it's, I thought it was on this slide, there must be a later slide that talks about the file extension. Um, there are different implementation modes of how you use that MRF format. Um, and again, I don't know if I, I don't think I, I don't think we'll have time to get into the different modes. I've actually hidden one slide that I thought would just confuse the discussion, but there is more material here if, if you want to read more about it. Um, okay, yeah, it's on this slide. So 
if you're going to convert to MRF, at the very bottom we've got a link to where you can get this tool. We call it Optimized Rasters. So it's available as a Python toolbox and also command line. So if you want to script, if you want to script this, you can uh, use the command line version. It will convert from any of the GDAL supported formats into either MRF or if you don't necessarily want to drink this particular Kool-Aid and stick with TIFF, we can actually output those optimized tiled TIFFs as well. Uh, we've got a bunch of predefined templates depending on where you're coming from, where you're writing to. Example would be Amazon versus Azure. So with the optimized rasters download, you'll see a number of templates that configure this for you. And then it'll be up to you to modify some of the parameters to set up your system the way you want to. This does include uploading and downloading options. So if you're going from your desktop and if you've got a few tens of gigabytes of data, you can use optimized rasters to write directly into your S3 bucket. Uh, and it, uh, the next slide, I think, says this, but if you've got terabytes or petabytes of data, what you'll end up wanting to do is shipping a hard disk to Amazon and then get that attached to your EBS or to your EC2 instance, run optimized rasters in Amazon or in Azure to copy the data into S3 and, and optimize at that point. Um, near the bottom, running independent of ArcGIS, this does not require an ArcGIS license. So uh, if you need to deploy this on number, uh, numer numerous systems, you don't have to have ArcGIS installed to run optimized rasters. Uh, and at the bottom, this includes very robust logging support. So if you are uploading from local to the cloud and something gets interrupted, we keep very detailed logs so that the system can, the, the software can pick up again and not have to start over. So, uh, so it's a very powerful tool. Um, this slide I was going to mostly skip over, although I've kind of mentioned this already. Um, well, I guess the first two lines, if you are copying data to the cloud, you can certainly use other methods. Uh, the AWS command line, there are tools such as uh, Cloudberry, um, S, uh, S3 Fox, there are quite a number of tools. If you're going from your office, you can use optimized rasters, enter your credentials, and copy directly into the cloud. Uh, and that second sub-bullet, the option to create raster proxies, that's something that I'm coming back to. Uh, but again, we, uh, you can run this from your desktop. At the bottom, if you've really got large data volumes, again, you'll ship a disk to Amazon, they'll copy it for you, and then you can run optimized rasters in the cloud if you need to change, uh, change format. Um, okay, so I've kind of hinted at this or touched on this, but just to be explicit, ArcGIS only wants to see images coming from a file system. So it doesn't inherently understand how to read from an HTTP address or a REST call in the case of Azure. It wants to see C, drive, C colon or D colon. It wants to see a file system. So we use local copies that we call raster proxies that link to the MRF files in the cloud. Or I, let me say that again, link to your imagery in the cloud. Again, it does not have to be MRF. The raster proxy method will work with tiled GeoTIFFs or other formats or the cloud-optimized GeoTIFF in the cloud, but most everything I've, that we've implemented has been MRF. Um, so ArcGIS reads a raster proxy file. What that is is a small file stored locally with links to your S3 data, and it acts and behaves as if it's local data, but then when ArcGIS tries to read the pixels, those have to actually come from S3 and get, uh, and get copied locally. Um, and then specific detail on Amazon S3, you've got to have BOTO3. I've done this once. If you, I don't know any details about BOTO. We'll have to, have to get somebody else to help you with details on that. Um, so, but the idea with the raster proxy, again, is that we've got a small file for each of our image files that represents a larger TIFF file, and that's, what you, that's where you build your mosaic data set and point it at those raster proxies. This does work from the desktop. So if I've got raster proxies for large data files in the Amazon cloud, you can actually access from desktop over the network to the cloud, but it's not terribly efficient. This is really built for servers in the cloud sitting right next to S3 to efficiently access data from S3. Um, a, a few of the issues, uh, right there in the middle it says you can have any raster extension 
This can get a little bit confusing, but you can take a TIFF file, make a raster proxy, and still call it TIFF. So visually in the file system, it will look like the same file, but it's not the actual TIFF file. It's the, it's a, it's one of these smaller versions that actually points to the actual TIFF file in Amazon. So I would tip, I typically recommend when you create these proxies, use the .mrf extension so you can tell by looking at it in the file system what you're seeing are proxies. But if you've already built historical systems and you're already pointing at thousands or millions of TIFF files, you don't have to rebuild those mosaics. That's part of the point. If you've got a mosaic data set that's pointing at file.tiff, we can replace them with raster proxies and it'll have exactly the same extension and your mosaic data set will still work, but now it's a proxy pointing at something in cloud storage. Um, toward the bottom, needing to consider the cache location and manage the cache, that's on your server. When you're caching pixels locally, you do have to spend a little bit of effort managing and thinking about how large that storage is and how often you flush that cache out. But typically you would configure that to erase anything that's more than a week old, but if you've got a spike in demand and someone, you've got a lot of servers hitting a particular area of imagery, you're making local caches, local cache copies, so you only read from S3 once and, and then read from, subsequently from that local cache. Um, so that, I hope that's enough on that slide. Okay, so that was part two, talking about the data storage and the data, uh, data access. I want to now show you some rather busy slides, and I apologize if this isn't a very big room. Hopefully you can read it from the back. But there are a few different specific architectures depending on how much data you've got, how often the data sets are updated, that sort of thing. So one scenario is you can, if you've heard about enterprise and how at 10.6 we've split ArcGIS server from ArcGIS image server, what we're showing here is you don't absolutely have to run those on separate hardware. If you're not, if you don't have a, a, a large, uh, a, a, if you're not doing really a lot of heavy duty image server activity, you can put both image server and ArcGIS server on the same system. Uh, in this case, we're showing two systems behind a load balancer um, and then this, the, the graphic may not be clear, but what we're indicating is in this scenario, you can read from S3 and use the proxy method that I was referring to, um, but this is one of the simpler configurations. Um, and I should also say, for this section of the presentation, I'm definitely not an expert, so you can probably ask me too many questions that I can't answer, but I can get you to the right person. Um, but in this case, this does allow you, uh, seamless recovery if you've got multiple copies of your server. Uh, if one goes down, you can replicate and, and you can also scale this up if, you, if demand spikes and you need more servers. Um, and part of the key is that I, I guess I didn't focus on, but maybe this is obvious. If you're using EBS, the elastic block storage, in this scenario and you're not using those proxies, you're not reading from S3, if I have to scale up and add a third server or five more servers, you have to copy data from one EBS drive to another EBS drive. And in this scenario, in this mode, we're able to scale up new servers almost instantly, a matter of just a few minutes, and they're accessing the same data directly from S3, so it scales up and down much faster. Um, so, in this case, uh, each of the systems, if you're familiar with, the, with our server implementation, you've got to have a configuration store. In this case, each machine has its own configuration store. If you've got data that's changing frequently and you need to update your mosaic data sets on a frequent basis, we're doing some implementations with RDS where the mosaic data set is not stored on the server, but it's stored in Postgres on, uh, using RDS. And again, I will volunteer, I am not an expert in this, so I won't be able to really answer deep dive questions, but this would be the configuration if you're going to be frequently updating your Mosaic data set. Uh, I skipped over the part um, up above where it says, we're not running raster analytics. Um, so 
again, if you've seen some of our presentations on raster analytics, these first two configurations don't support that raster analytic processing. Um, and I guess I think that's about everything here. If you do want to scale up to raster analytics, this would be more the configuration that you would use where you've got your ArcGIS image server in portal on the left and you've got a dynamic image server for sharing imagery in the center and you've got one or more systems that scale out to run raster analytics. If you need to do that rapid processing on large areas, parallel processing to build out very large data sets using raster analytics. Uh, and in this case, another difference is that the configuration store is actually on a separate EC2 instance to manage your, your multiple, ac or multiple instances of raster analytics accessing that. Uh, so this is, again, if you're scaling up to a larger configuration. And then the last would be combining the second and third slides where we are running raster analytics and we've got frequent update of the mosaic data set so we're using RDS to be able to manage that frequently updating uh, mosaic data set. Okay, I wanted to keep five minutes or more for questions. There are more slides that I've skipped over but I'm gonna stop at this point Actually, I'm not quite ready. Uh, we do have CloudFormation templates. If you want to implement some of this, uh, these are for 1051, and I'll give you these slides. So if, you're, if any of your pictures don't turn out very good, I'll wait just another few seconds. If you're on 105, the uh, CloudFormation templates are different. But again, I'll be happy to give you these links and put you in touch with the engineer who can actually explain how all of this works to set up some of these configurations. Uh, but again, I'm really not an expert on some of these different server configurations. So I think that's all I've got. This is my email. Let me go ahead and stop there. I know that was an awful lot of material. Any questions that I may be able to answer for you? I should have had TJ ready with a softball question. Is that what they call it? So if you haven't seen that source-derived model where we're going from many data sets into one central collection, if you haven't seen that, please do touch base with us before you try and implement it because we've got sample scripts that'll show you how to do all the configuration settings. Uh, if you need help with the raster proxies and the MRF format, uh, I know a little bit more about that. I could help with some of that, but I would probably put you in touch with our engineers. But again, we've got sample implementations. Uh, yes, question in the back? I do, oh, I think I know what you're saying, yes. So if you couldn't hear the question was, does this apply to local hardware? No, it does not have, or yes it does, it does not have to be cloud only. Um, but you said something about, uh, at the very end you said something about building in one place and serving from somewhere else. And some of these configurations, you want your server and your disk to be together. You don't want to be going over a network for the data. Um, so okay, but yes, this is applicable to your own local hardware. It doesn't, it's not cloud only. So thanks for, for bringing that up. That should be on a slide. I must have put you all to sleep. There no, no more questions? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah talk to him. No, you, the, the imagery island is right here behind us. So yeah, we could, we could talk to you now and figure out which, what, what you need help with. And, and get you more resources. Oh, and if you want the slides, I think they're posted through the, the whole EPC, but I can certainly send them to you. Uh, and actually what I will send you if you want, I'll send you the slides that were hidden as well. So those three sections, there are quite a number, I mean these are each two hour topics, so there are a lot more slides if you want those. Uh, let me know, if you just want the brief set of slides, I'll send you these, but I can send you more slides. Yes? Right. What is, what is frequent? So the question was using RDS if, if, if you're not updating your mosaic frequently. Um, that's, and the question was what, what do we consider frequent? I, I guess what I would say is whatever you would consider to be um, something you don't want to, to manage manually. But 
typically, uh, one quick example, the Landsat service is 600 images, which is 600 gigabytes every 24 hours gets processed, and that's fully automatic. So we're using the first section, that, that data stru or the, the source derived model to automate that. But if you're only updating your Mosaic data set twice a year or something like that, I wouldn't bother with RDS. Um, and again, I'm not an expert on RDS, but we've got many implementations where it's every day, it's every two or three days, uh, some weather examples, every 15 minutes they want to publish the last 10 images. So if you, if you need to automate something, that's really the key where RDS comes into, into play. Any other questions? The, again, the imagery island's right back here if you wanna talk one-on-one -on -one and not reveal your secrets to everybody else in the room. Thank you.